two men went up into the temple to pray. The one was a Pharisee and the other a publican. Words taken from today's Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. On November 26th, 1971, the front page of a major newspaper in England provided the following announcement, quote, as from this Sunday, the first Sunday in Advent, it is forbidden to offer mass in the Tridentine Rite anywhere in the world. In very special circumstances, the article from the paper added, Old and retired priests may apply to their own bishop permission to use this rite, but only for private use, unquote. The ancient mass of Rome, the oldest and most dignified mass ritual in the history of Christian liturgy, had been suppressed by Pope Paul VI. From that point forward, the only mass for the Latin rite was the Novus Ordo Misse, or the Pauline Missal. Only the modern rite was approved as a universal liturgy for the Latin rite. And yet only a few days after, only a few days after that announcement of the death of the old rite, the same paper in England had a rather different announcement. It read, quote, Pope allows the traditional Latin mass in England and Wales, unquote. In England and Wales, the ancient liturgy continued, albeit in a very limited way, despite its suppression by the Pope in other areas. What happened? Why this unusual permission? Why this indult of the old mass in those two areas? Well, it seems that an influential letter was sent to the Pope, signed by various important figures in England, which begged that an exception be made. The letter in question was not so much focused on the piety or spirituality of the faithful, which would no doubt be harmed by the suppression of the old rite, but rather the letter pointed out the incredible cultural significance of the traditional Latin Mass, which was at the foundation of nearly all the cultural achievements of Christendom. The letter in question read the following, quote, Today, as in times gone by, certain people are in the vanguard where recognition of the value of tradition is concerned and are the first to raise the alarm when it is threatened. The letter continued, we are not at this moment considering the spiritual or religious experiences of millions of individuals. The right in question in its magnificent Latin text has also inspired a host of priceless achievements in the arts. Not only mystical works, but works by poets, philosophers, musicians, architects, painters, sculptors, in all countries and all epochs, unquote. In other words, the traditional Latin mass inspired Michelangelo's Pieta statue. The traditional Latin mass inspired Mozart's mass settings. And the traditional Latin Mass inspired the stained glass windows which are in Chartres Cathedral in France. So please, Holy Father, don't suppress the Mass of old because it's the very foundation of Christian culture. Altogether, 50 individuals of note signed that letter, including the famous author Graham Greene, the accomplished musical conductor Colin Davis, the journalist, well-known traditionalist Malcolm Muggeridge, and William Rees Mogg, the editor of the London Times, and the father of the well known traditional Catholic today and leader of the House of Commons, namely Jacob Rees Mogg. But there was one name in particular signed on that letter that was particularly important, at least in so far as Pope Paul VI was concerned. That name was Agatha Christie, the famous mystery writer who happened to be one of the Pope's favorite authors. Although she was not Catholic, Agatha Christie knew the cultural importance of the Mass of the Ages. Pope Paul VI, it is said, was reading quietly through the letter and then through the list of signers of that letter, and then suddenly he said, ah, Agatha Christie signed it. And so the Pope agreed to the request. 
From that day forward, the special permission for the continuation of the Jerusalem Latin Mass in England and Wales has been popularly named the Agatha Christie Indult. It's interesting that Pope Paul VI, like the signers of that letter, very much realized the tremendous loss to Western culture that it would suffer due to the suppression of the traditional Latin Mass. In speaking about the upcoming Novus Ordo Mise, the new Mass, in November of 1969, the Holy Father clearly admitted that a brand new rite was being introduced that would represent, quote, a change in the venerable tradition that has gone on for centuries. And that this change would affect, quote, our inheritance, which seemed to enjoy the privilege of being untouchable and settled. It seemed to bring the prayer of our forefathers and our saints to our lips and to give us the comfort of feeling faithful to our spiritual past, which we kept alive to pass on to future generations, unquote. It's going to be quite a loss, the greatest you could imagine. The Holy Father also realized that the radical change in liturgy would be very disturbing to people. The newer ceremonies which were to replace the rites of antiquity, stated the Holy Father, would bring about, quote, some feeling of annoyance and that we must prepare, quote, for this many-sided inconvenience. You're not going to like it. It's the kind of upset, he continued, caused by every novelty that breaks in on our habits. And then he adds this line, which is really telling. We shall notice that pious persons are disturbed the most, unquote. Prayerful, pious, devotional, spiritual people will be disturbed the most. The Holy Father then laments of the incalculable loss to the church of the Latin language and the liturgy. He states, quote, the introduction of the vernacular, the mother tongue, will certainly be a great sacrifice for those who know the beauty, the power, and the expressive sacrality, the holiness of the Latin language. He then adds, we are parting with the speech of Christian centuries. We will lose that great part of stupendous and com incomparable artistic worth, the Gregorian chant. We're going to lose the Gregorian chant. This is the greatest material treasure the church has, her music. You're going to lose it. And concluding his address regarding the changes, you wonder why Pope Paul VI ever to decide, decided to remove, by and large, Latin from the liturgy, which he and so, much, so many others appreciated so much. He stated, we have reason indeed for regret, reason also for bewilderment. What can we put in the place of the language of the angels? And then he adds, we're giving up something of priceless worth. Priceless, we're giving it up. But according to the Holy Father, it was all worth it. For it was going to be done for the sake of human beings. For the sake of modern men, vernacular liturgy, the mother tongue, was more appealing to modern men who are so fond of plain, everyday, normal language. As many of you might know, Cardinal Ratzinger's view on suppressing the old rite and developing the new rite was not very enthusiastic. Ratzinger stated that the authors of the new liturgy did not bring about an organic growth in the mass ritual, but rather a certain inorganic rupture and discontinuity. As the Cardinal observed, the Novus Ordo Mise, the new mass, was, quote, a fabrication, a banal, that is, dull, unimaginative, on-the-spot product, unquote. But we need to consider this even further. The suppression of the old Latin mass and the introduction of the new mass was not just a cultural loss and a liturgical mess, but it may have contributed to the lessening of the faith itself. There's an important Latin phrase that all of us should know. 
And that phrase is lex orandi, lex credendi. Lex orandi, lex credendi translates into the law of prayer is the law of faith. In other words, the church believes exactly as she prays. How we pray shapes how we believe. This means that the church's liturgy, how she prays, is the most effective means of preserving and interpreting the one true faith. Not only do the inerrant scriptures and sacred tradition pass on the faith to us, but also the liturgy passes on the apostolic tradition. The church's prayer, her rituals, are an authentic source of theology. So when a decision is made to change the liturgy radically, the way we pray, it could affect, perhaps, the way we believe. According to Father Carlos Braga, he was a main assistant of Archbishop Bugnini in composing the new rite of Mass. The new Mass has, quote, an entirely new foundation of Eucharistic theology. It's a new way of looking at the Eucharist. And whose ecumenical requirements, he adds, are in harmony with the church's new positions. It's more ecumenical, reaching out to non-Catholics. Remember, too, also the famous Cardinal Ottaviani and Cardinal Bacci. They made that intervention. You might even read the book, Ottaviani Intervention, which protested the new liturgy. Although both churchmen eventually made a number of retractions, their initial concerns are worth noting. Ottaviani and Bacci, cardinals, stated that their intervention was needed because, quote, the Novus Ordo Mise, considering the new elements widely susceptible to widely different interpretations, which are implied or taken for granted, represents both as a whole and in its details a striking departure from the Catholic theology of the Mass as defined at the Council of Trent. And we have the most recent example of the Moda Proprio, that is the newest text given to us by our Holy Father, Pope Francis, called Traditionis Custodes, Guardians of Tradition. In one article, the first article, in fact, of that document, which is a governing document, it clearly states that the Novus Ordo Missae, the new Mass, and the liturgical books of Pope Paul VI, quote, constitute the unique expression of the lex orandi of the Roman rite. What is he saying? In other words, the new rite of mass is the one and only, no other, one and only law of praying now in the modern church, for it alone expresses what we believe. The conclusion seems obvious then. The old mass is no longer the lex orandi of the Latin rite. It's no longer the way we pray. We used to, we don't pray that way anymore. Does this mean then that we no longer believe the faith of our fathers as was expressed in the way we used to pray in the ancient liturgy of Rome? Whether or not our Holy Father realizes it, he's giving the impression to some that there might somehow be two altars two liturgies, even two faiths. By way of analogy, to go back to the gospel of the day, we have a pharisaical liturgy for the modern way of praying, where we approach near to the altar and we stand with pride. It's the liturgy for the privileged, where one can look down in a condescending way upon the way the church used to pray in the past. We're a new people. Where one can enter into the Holy of Holies, the sanctuary of boldness, nothing holds us back. Enter in. A, phys a pharisaical liturgy where man is more the focus, where Holy Communion can be taken in the hand like a man, where we are included in various ministries of the altar, no one's excluded, where people worship in the plain, ordinary language of the day, where music is more sentimental, more appealing to man, where readings are edited so as to remove things that might offend men's sensibilities, where the lit liturgy faces man, where altars are lowered and downsized so as to not diminish man. But then there's the publican liturgy, 
the publican liturgy, liturgy where man recognizes his nothingness before the Almighty. It's a liturgy today for the marginalized, for minorities, where the liturgy is, speaks of the greatness of God. The publican liturgy where man often strikes his breast, he admits his guilt. A liturgy where man often kneels in subjection to his Eucharistic King and Lord. It's a liturgy, the publican liturgy, where man dares not enter into the sanctuary. He dares not touch the holy instruments of sacrifice. Where man acknowledges the mystery and transcendence of God as emphasized by the sacred and mysterious veil of the Latin language and the Gregorian chant. Where men, priests, and all participants face the good Lord, and their minds soar upwards as they gaze upon the high altar and the rare dose. For man feels small and little before the Creator, and where man receives on his knees and only on the tongue, being fed the bread of angels. As a final note, our personal parish and our mission chapel to our south will continue, please God, to operate in the diocese. We are assured of that. But assurances. We have been protected by Our Lady, no doubt, and protected by our good bishop. And so we'll continue to pray and to believe the way that the Church of Rome has always prayed and believed in the past. The mode appropriate of our Holy Father seems to hold us and others in suspicion. Article 1 of the document reads, quote, The bishop of the diocese is to determine that these groups, old mass groups, do not deny the validity and legitimacy of the liturgical reform dictated by Vatican Council II and the Magisterium of the Supreme Pontiffs, unquote like a little bit of a litmus test. I wonder if they ever ask if others acknowledge the Council of Florence <laughs> or the Council of Trent. This is the one litmus test, isn't it? Now, I, I've attended the Nova Sordo Mise for most of my formative life when I was younger. And I offered the new mass as a priest for the first 11 years of my priesthood. Of course, it's valid. Of course, it represents, essentially, the one sacrifice of Calvary in an unbloody manner. And as a result, it brings down the fruits of redemption. But with all that being said, I also reject the liturgical reform that would destroy the ancient mass of Rome. And I reject those revolutionary characters and actors behind the scenes and their unorganic development of the new rite, which created, according to Cardinal Ratzinger, discontinuity and rupture in the way the church has prayed. You know, many of you travel a long way to come here on Sundays. And, and some of you have even moved from other parts of the country in order to come to this particular chapel or many other Latin Mass chapels. Though there are plenty of regular Masses and New Rite parishes right next to you, in a sense, then, all of us here reject the liturgical form in some way. I, as well as many of you, moved away from the new rite, not purely because of preference, not because, oh, it's better music, or they don't use altar girls, something deeper. It's because of necessity, not preference, necessity. We need this Mass. For how the church prays is how she believes. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.